All right. Thanks, Matt, Prithvi. Thanks uh, to CNCF for bringing this first ever Litmus Chaos Con. Excited to be here. Um, <clears throat> I'm Umar Mukara, Head of Chaos Engineering at Hornis. I'm also one of uh, the maintainers and co-creators of Litmus Chaos. We started this uh, project uh, back in 2017. Um, it's been a great journey so far. Um, a lot of uh, adoption across the enterprises, across the user, end user community, SREs. Uh, it's great to be associated with uh, the Litmus community. So today, um, I'm actually not going to talk uh, uh, into the details of Litmus because there are so many sessions um, that talk about uh, what is Litmus, how it helps uh, in your day-to-day uh, -day reliability uh, issues, um, what are the best practices around Litmus. But actually, I'm going to talk in the next 20, 25 minutes about uh, uh, where do you put chaos engineering as a placeholder uh, in your uh, business, right? So why is it important? Specifically, um, I'm going to talk about this common challenges that uh, we are seeing in uh, almost every large enterprises, right? So uh, how is uh, the reliability services and developer efficiency are related to the business growth um, in, in the realm of SDLC, software development lifecycle. Uh, that will give you an idea of uh, where chaos um, uh, engineering comes in into the picture. And I'll probably talk about a few best practices uh, uh, towards the end. So um, DevOps have been, um, uh, the, the changes in DevOps have been uh, pretty fast in the last decade or so. Um, DevOps uh, transformations are primarily driven uh, by the need for speed. Uh, right, so the entire move to cloud native uh, is driven by the need for speed of delivery of the services, right? And um, the other challenges are related to okay, now I'm driving this uh, changes at a faster uh, rate. How is uh, reliability? Uh, is it in my control? And uh, I'm having a lot of developers, or they're doing the right things, right? So these are the typical challenges. And if you look at it, um, the speed part of it is kind of resolved. I would say there's so many CICD uh, related tooling, uh, very mature, both um, open source as well as uh, uh, vendor specific. But um, you're now having Kubernetes as a, a mainstream architecture or a distributed architecture framework. And uh, the tooling around that is helping you get um, to get the workloads containerized and deliver them at speed, right? Whereas the reliability and developer efficiency are still the topics of a bit of a concern. Um, there are a lot of uh, solutions that are available, a lot of uh, thought processes on how to be efficient uh, in these two aspects, right? So precisely that's what uh, we're going to talk about. So why is a problem of developer efficiency coming onto uh, here as a topic, right? So uh, developers are pretty good nowadays in cloud native development, but they're not probably so good in uh, how well they're prepared to respond to incidents. And uh, they are still being called um, to respond to the incidents, to resolve the incidents, um, et cetera, et cetera, um, it's uh, still a developer's job, right? And uh, the common pattern that we are observing is developers are debugging uh, design issues, architecture issues. They're learning a lot during the incident response process, right? Um, so uh, it really makes the developers um, to think about the reliability aspects only during um, the incidents, right? So that's probably not the best use of developers' time, right? They should rather focus on what they're supposed to do, right? Reliability, maintenance of reliability is the developer's job, no question about it. But uh, would you rather have those developers focus on such issues during the incidents or prior to the uh, incidents or during the development or during design times? Obviously, during the design and development, yeah, they should rather focus on um, the reliability, right? 
So developers should be uh, training themselves uh, prior to the incidents uh, in order to respond to the incidents, right? And uh, they should be uh, having a vision or a view of trying to automate this reliability testing even before um, the incident happens or um, they try to avoid uh, the incidents from happening, right? So the good case of developer efficiency is when they are thinking about reliability much before the issues happen, right? And what happens if uh, developers actually do that, right? So if they're focusing on reliability, um, the developer efficiency increases. So they would rather focus uh, reliability issues at the design time, development time, testing time. And uh, the, the in case the incidents happen, they're bound to happen even if you are uh, focusing um, the rate of uh, incidents may reduce, but the incidents do happen. But you will be able to get the recovery of the systems uh, faster, right? And uh, because of that, your end users' experience will be much faster, much better. And uh, overall business growth also will be better because your customers are happy, you're incurring a lot less losses, and uh, the growth uh, is going to uh, spiral up, right? So it's basically... For your end users need to be happy, uh, the services have to be reliable. For the services to be reliable, your developers need to focus um, uh, with an efficiency angle, not during the incidents, but prior to the incidents, right? So if your developer efficiency is high, reliability also is high. If it is low, um, there is a chance of incidents happening, uh, recovering uh, slowly, et cetera, et cetera, which means that reliability is not good, right? So um, the summary of this is reliability needs to be measured, obviously, in the production, but they, it needs to be tackled in the lower environments, right? So developer efficiency, reliability uh, needs to be planned, executed, uh, kind of measured in the lower environments. That's kind of the summary uh, of the message that I'm trying to put forth here, right? So how do you tackle reliability in the lower environments, right? And that's where chaos engineering comes in into the picture, right? So uh, chaos engineering, as we all know, it's kind of a, a culture uh, that adds on to your regular uh, aspects of SDLC. So it's a new culture. A lot of them are doing uh, now. Um, so the idea of tackling the reliability in the lower environments is to introduce the chaos engineering culture into the SDLC. And uh, uh, let me just uh, brush upon what is chaos engineering, right? So chaos engineering is uh, is really about um, whatever can go wrong will go wrong. So, but let me uh, bring the faults in a systematic controlled way into the system and uh, see if my uh, expected resilience is still in place. If not, I would mark it as a weakness and then I have a chance to work upon in a controlled environment, right? And process of automating this entire uh, process or the steps is really the engineering part of uh, chaos engineering, right? So you take um, uh, an aspect of a system, um, create a hypothesis that a system needs to be resilient under certain fault conditions, introduce those faults, measure uh, the hypothesis, see if it matches and then move on to the next uh, hypothesis. So that is uh, chaos engineering. And when you automate that, um, it starts giving uh, more or less benefits, right? So uh, where are we seeing this chaos engineering? Um, uh, compared to five, six years ago, chaos engineering is very much um, in practice in most of the organizations now. Uh, most of the organizations are uh, kind of um, started adopting, but uh, now in the process of scaling up, Right. So financial services, um, because the customer experience, uh, your end user experience is uh, super important. And uh, that's where um, the business related losses will be high in, in case of uh, outages. Um, that's where we are seeing the largest uh, adoption. And there are also scenarios where um, companies are repurposing the DR investments uh, into chaos engineering adoption because you can not only test, uh, the regular reliability, you can also simulate the DR scenarios and verify using chaos engineering practice, right? And uh, when uh, highly scaled environments uh, to control the reliability, when everything else falls, 
uh, fails, um, chaos engineering will help. And obviously, cloud native environments, Kubernetes environments, uh, chaos engineering is almost a need rather than uh, a kind of a, um, a requirement uh, for reliability. Uh, without uh, chaos engineering uh, in Kubernetes environments, you're almost missing uh, some part of your SDLC uh, processes, right? And how long does it take uh, for chaos engineering to mature? It takes, if you are doing it uh, very diligently and well budgeted, this entire practice, it takes two to three years to get to some level, right? Otherwise, it could take even more. Uh, so there are largely, um, you start uh, or start testing uh, in one area, try to automate, and that's when you say, I know how to do chaos engineering, and then you scale it up. And then you randomize at export level. So just uh, keep that in mind. So it's not a quick action. Uh, it takes time. And uh, we are seeing large enterprises now. They are redefining their uh, way of chaos uh, experimentation, uh, which they started five, six years ago. Right. So um, just like any other engineering uh, practice, chaos engineering also will uh, keep evolving into a better way of doing uh, there are a lot of AI-related um, stuff is going to come in the next uh, few years. Chaos engineering definitely is going to be much, much easier to practice than uh, what it is thought to be. And it is being practiced more often in the lower environments than in production, right? Um, that's that's what more. Um, so let me also uh, quickly talk through um, uh, what should be my uh, KPIs, right? Performance indicators. Uh, with respect to chaos uh, should i be uh, measuring the resilience improvements or should i be uh, measuring some aspects of uh, chaos engineering practice itself right what should be your kpis so kpis um, are of two types uh, in my opinion uh, when it comes to chaos engineering implementation right so uh, there should be some um, specific kpis to see how good uh, you are in terms of implementation of chaos itself and then the benefits of implementing chaos engineering is really improving resilience. Keep those KPIs separately. And what are the implementation KPIs, right? Um, how many services are undergoing um, chaos testing? How many teams are doing? How many applications? This is uh, some of the KPIs that you need to define and follow through. And within those, um, right, how many chaos experiments uh, that are possible versus how many you are running. Uh, that's kind of like a resilience coverage, I would say. Uh, just like a code coverage, uh, you will have uh, the opportunity to think through in terms of resilience coverage as a metric, right? And within those that are covered, you will have the ability to measure uh, this chaos experiment is producing certain level of resilience score, right? And this is uh, expected versus actual and chaos is injected. And then uh, the good old uh, days of uh, doing chaos experimentation is game days. They're still good. Uh, they go in towards uh, production, uh, even though production automation is also possible immediately after deploying uh, the newer builds. Uh, I'm seeing people are running chaos experiments, but game days are still a good practice. How many of them are there, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Similarly, uh, the KPIs for uh, resilience side, uh, when you do chaos, uh, practice, uh, you're expecting the resilience to be improved, right? And how do you measure that, right? One way is not directly to jump in, hey, you know, uh, the number of uh, faults uh, outages reduced, that probably not the best way to keep it. Um, and you are running chaos, but how much of them are being automated, right? The moment you're automating the chaos experimentation in your pipelines, you are improving the resilience in production because you are cutting down the number of opportunities to leak the resilience issues onto your production. That is automatically improving the resilience. You just stopped a bug uh, related to an outage going into production. So that's uh, you know keeping up uh, the resilience itself, right? So how important, uh, how, how much of automation are we doing is a KPI for uh, resilience improvement. Um, And then um, the other way to think about is uh, how much of um, service level indicators have been improved by the developers. Remember, we talked about developers directly contributing to the reliability, right? 
So if developers are being efficient, they would be thinking of adding new SLIs or uh, updating the existing service level indicators as related to the um, reliability, right? So if your developers are doing chaos practice and you don't see any new SLIs are being introduced, uh, there is still uh, something wrong. Uh, it's a natural outcome that developers are seeing the need for new SLIs when chaos experiments are being automated uh, or being run at large numbers, right? So, and then uh, when you run chaos uh, experiments, you find weaknesses and you just need to uh, keep an eye on how many of the configuration issues have been found and uh, are we improving the changes uh, to the recovery uh, scripts, right? So is my recovery script changing fast enough? Uh, if it is, then that really means that, you know, there is an active focus on reducing the MTTR. And finally, the MTTR um, itself should reduce, right? If you see all this, about three of them, the MTTR automatically reduced, right? I would not keep a KPI of um, the reduction in the outages itself as a direct uh, chaos engineering practice that might come uh, in a long term. But um, the good metric is to actually uh, keep the MTTR uh, reduced by a certain percentage or a period of time. But more important, the other KPIs, the above uh, three KPIs that are mentioned here about the MTTR. Um, <clears throat> now, let me uh, quickly go through the best practices in the next uh, five to six minutes, and then probably we can uh, take some questions as well. Right. As uh, I mentioned earlier, the maturity uh, model around chaos um, usually uh, takes time um, to get your chaos practice to a maturity level. Uh, it could be two to three years, sometimes in larger organization. It's longer, depends on how much focus has been put in, business priorities, budgets, uh, et cetera, et cetera, All right? So, um, but I'm going to talk through some 10 um, almost like well-known best practices. It's kind of a recap, right? So uh, one of the um, most common hindrances for practicing chaos engineering is that you think you have uh, the permission to execute chaos, but you might not. Right. So it's good to focus on uh, the strategy to get the right security clearances up front and uh, have those persons involved in chaos practice and then uh, design the service accounts in such a way uh, that um, they're all going to be aligned with uh, the practice of chaos engineering. Right. Um, and then start the second one, start in QA or pre prod. Um, this is like, you know, shift right of chaos, then shift left, right? Um, in many organizations, you start chaos primarily in the earlier days, um, let's say, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, you do it as primarily as a SRA practice. And then, you know, hey, can I also do chaos in QA? But uh, the modern uh, SDLC practices uh, are seeing chaos as like, let's start in QA, right? So it um, actually involves the developers uh, first, and then the learnings, the improved SLIs are given then to the SREs. That actually is a natural flow, right? Um, the third uh, practice is start slow, start with one team, uh, but define the KPIs that are aligned to your um, the chaos. Uh, measurement KPS itself, chaos coverage, resilience coverage, resilience codes. Um, these are very important for any organization um, to be defined and agreed upon. And this is kind of like a real chaos culture, right? Just like a good engineering practice will have uh, the insights around um, how developer efficiency around uh, the development testing you need to have a similar um, culture around resilience as well, right? So uh, keep this early uh, in the culture cycle uh, while chaos is being practiced with one team so that this gets spread to the other teams naturally when you um, uh, go uh, with chaos to the other team or other application or the service. And um, uh, kind of try to keep a rule that any chaos experiment, if it is written, certified, uh, is a golden copy. Uh, that really means that if 
a fault is introduced, I know what to expect, right? Uh, I know what resilience checks need to be there. So if uh, a golden copy is uh, prepared, there's no need for humans to come and run it. It should be automated, right? Try to put it in the pipelines. That's when the resilience improvements. You remember we talked about resilience KPIs. One of them is chaos needs to be automated. So it's a good practice to automate. Uh, if you are running uh, now and then, uh, I ran 100 chaos experiments last month, you know, that does not mean much if we have 1,000 of them already in place, right? So it should be automated. And uh, uh, the other ones um, that I've seen is a lot of weaknesses are found, but they're not organized uh, for tracking resolutions. Uh, developers keep changing. So uh, have good practices around uh tracking uh, the issues it could be configuration issues right um uh, sometimes you find an issue and you don't need to actually run those chaos experiment again because it is already breaking right so you need to track it through a ticket at the same time you need to avoid running it because you need to find other issues other weaknesses so they need to be governed for blast radius control um, uh, make sure that the same chaos experiment is not run until the fix is given, but the fix is being tracked. So that's a good practice so that the chaos coverage, uh, the resilience coverage will improve. Uh, otherwise, you keep breaking the system at the same time, uh, and then you know you don't move forward to find the newer weaknesses. Right? And dependencies are very important, just like a design uh, is uh, very important for uh, a good software. Dependencies or service catalogs are very important for chaos engineering to be effective so that you are always breaking the dependencies to see that you know resilience is there or not. Um, and then steady state hypothesis checks in uh, litmus language is called uh, resilience probes. You temporize them, keep adding uh, you know hundreds, thousands of resilience probes into the system so that you know uh, you can use them as many as possible around chaos tests. So um, if you are not having enough, that means you know you are uh, having a higher probability to give false positives or negatives around resilience. Right? Um, have a developer uh, role and a runner role, chaos developer and runner. Uh, not everyone needs to be uh, developing uh, chaos. Uh, rather, almost everyone should be running chaos. Right. So um, it, it's good to have um, chaos tests are being done by one developer and 10 of them, other developers are actually taking it and putting into pipelines or elsewhere, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a good practice to uh, keep a ratio. Not everyone is uh, doing chaos uh, or a few people are uh, developing chaos experiments and nobody else is bothered about it. Right? That's not a good practice. And the next one is once you have this first one done, automation is done, uh, you have to have a buy-in from the management system, uh, uh, management to scale and adopt because a lot of hard work is already done. And um, uh, there should be a business uh, alignment around taking these best practices, the, all the hard work to more uh, services. So it's good to have that uh, vision and alignment in the very beginning itself, right? And um, while you go through the chaos engineering practice in the beginning, a lot of it may be with developers, but SR is are super important because that's where the actual reliability is measured. So uh, it's good to have a, a tightly held uh, coordination or relationship between developers and SREs with chaos engineering uh, improvements as a focus. Right. So those are some of the best practices that I could think of. So with that, um, I can take some more questions. Uh, we have two more minutes, um, but uh, thank you for this opportunity, uh, CNCF and the community. And there are a lot of uh, litmus talks uh, ahead, uh, more exciting ones, I'm sure. So have a great conference. Right. Hey, Uma, great job. Thanks for keynoting as always. Appreciate the insights and best practices. Um, before anybody, if you want to pop in some questions, please, there's time. And if we don't get through all of them, Uma can answer those in Slack, um, cause we have a Slack channel for this as well. Um, so one question that I'd like to ask, you know, so most engineers and SREs already do load testing. Um, but when they talk to their manager, um, about chaos testing, the manager's always like, eh, not yet. Like what's one bit of advice to convince that 
you know, head of engineering to start? So don't ask your manager, can I break it? Uh, ask your manager, can I prove that there is resilience in the system, right? So try to uh, write, automate uh, chaos tests for um, uh, cases that works. So your uh, team will know that I got 10 chaos experiments which are giving positive results. That's a great start, right? That also improves your chaos coverage, resilience coverage. And then, you know, uh, if there is, it should not uh, lead to uh, the blame uh, culture, but um, yeah, good practice is to start on the positive side. That that okay. works. Uh, that has worked uh, many times. I can see. For that, awesome. Yep, that's great. Yeah, I always like to say put something in your Jira ticket too for testing, um, so you can document it and show your manager as well. So that's great. Um, so in your crystal ball of the, seeing the future, like what's one? one thing in the next few years you see with chaos engineering that you'd like to kind of end <clears throat> keynote on? I think there's a lot, uh, a lot of Gen AI uh, around chaos engineering too, right? So you can talk to the chaos tooling and um, uh, the system talks back to you, right? So ease of use is going to be much more and that will uh, lead um, the adoption of uh, chaos uh, at a larger scale. Right, so adoption is still, I would say, less than 10% overall in the market. But um, the need for adoption is probably, you know, uh, it needs to be at uh, more than 50%. So Gen AI will help. Awesome. Well, that's great. Um, you know, we're going to roll right into the next uh, set of presentations. Um, Uma will be available to answer questions in the Slack channel that we have set up as well. Um, I share my screen here, kind of, sh it'll show you um, the Slack space that you can join um, as well, just to answer or ask questions. Um, so, you know, we'll kind of move into the next presentations here as we go through, but thank you so much, Uma, for your keynote. Again, it's great insights and best practices and um, pleasure working with you as always, so. Thanks everyone, have a great conference ahead, cheers.